you have a copy of the Word of God, please turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we'll read here in a few moments' time. Will you turn there? Can I thank Reverend Park and the Kirk Session here in Hebron for inviting myself along to preach the Gospel? What a tremendous privilege it is to preach the Gospel. And I trust that as you sit under the Gospel over the next number of weeks, that your heart will be stirred and that you'll do your part in inviting others And under the sound of the word, I'll be bringing uh, the word of God. But it is your responsibility as a congregation uh, to invite family and friends and loved ones and work colleagues in under the sound of the gospel. And I trust that you'll take that uh, to heart. We were thinking this morning in our own place about biblical zeal. And we thought about how the scribes and the Pharisees, they crossed land and sea to make one proselyte. And yet... We can't even cross the street to invite someone in for a gospel mission. May God have mercy on us. May God give us, again, biblical zeal. Because, folks, I'm not here just to fill a pulpit for two weeks. I'm not here, as it were, to make a name for myself. God forbid. We're here for the souls of men and women. And I trust that you'll pray for me. And as our brother... Reverend Park has said, take a moment every day to pray for this mission that God will come down in power. Again, thank you, and I trust that God will bless us and his spirit will be poured out upon us even in this gospel mission. Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to read from the verse 20 of the chapter. Lord Jesus Christ is speaking here, and he said, Then began he to agree the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for thee. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto beads, even so, Father, for so it seemeth good in my sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. With the word of God open before us, let's unite in prayer and ask help from the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before thee tonight, fully and consciously aware of our need We're conscious, O God, that we're sinners in need of cleansing through the blood. We're conscious that we need the infilling of thy Spirit to come and enable us to preach the gospel as it was ever meant to be preached. And so we cry to thee, O God, for the divine anointing of thy Spirit. We pray for the anointing that breaks the yoke. Grant heavenly Father help and power As we minister thy word, give me, O God, the authority of a God-sent man, I pray. Grant, Heavenly Father, a shutting in to God. Every distraction be brought into subjection to Christ. Grant, O God, the atmosphere to be purged in the blood of the Lamb. Put a boundary, a good boundary of Christ's blood around this place. Put the fight, the wicked one, we pray. We thank thee for a stronger than he that has come, the blessed Son of God, 
Ronnie has spoiled principalities and powers. Pray for sinners in their sin tonight, that there might be an opening of heart and life to the Savior. For those that have wandered, may this be a homecoming meeting. And so bless us as we meet around thy word. And grant thy servant the help of God the Holy Spirit and magnify but one name in this place, the name of Christ my Savior, because I ask this in and through his name. Amen and amen. We live in a world of restlessness. Tonight there is restlessness in the nations. Wars rage, battles are being fought. Territory at this moment of time is being seized across the world. Recently, the independent newspaper carried the following article under the headline, World Peace. It said, with the crisis in Gaza and the rise of Islamic militants in Iraq and Syria, and the international standoff ongoing in Ukraine, it can sometimes feel as if the whole world is at war. It went on to say it may make for bleak reading, but out of the 162 countries covered by the Institute of Economics and Peace, just 11 are not involved in conflict in one kind or another. The nations are restless tonight. There's restlessness in homes. There's restlessness between husbands and wives. Statistics for domestic abuse show that one in four women and one in six men are affected by domestic abuse, leading on average to the murder of two women every week and 30 men every year. It was estimated in December 2012 that 42% of the marriages in England and Wales end in divorce. There's not only a restlessness between husbands and wives, but there's a restlessness between parents and children. The Children's Society commissioned a report in 2012, and they found that over 70,000 children between the ages of 14 and 15 every year run away for one night in England. From that, they estimated that 100,000 children and young people under the age of 16 run away in the UK each year. Why so many? The report cited family conflict and change of family structure of significant factors in children's decisions to run away. There's restlessness in individuals' lives. Isaiah the prophet was right when he spoke of the plight of the sinner using the imagery of the turbulent sea to, the, to depict the absence of any kind of peace within the sinner's life. He would say in Isaiah 57 in the verse 20 and 21, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You see that truth borne out by the fact that in 2013, 303 people committed suicide in Northern Ireland. In 2014, the Public Health Agency published their first annual report in the Northern Ireland Registry of Self-Harm. It reported there that between April 2012 and March 2015, or 2013, 5,970 people presented themselves to the emergency departments in Northern Ireland as a result of self-harm. The world, whether you look at it at the macro scale or the micro scale, whether you look at it at a public level or personal level, the world is restless with itself. The great physician of the soul, the Lord Jesus Christ, was aware of that very fact. He was aware of this inward restlessness and turmoil within the hearts and minds of ungodly men and women as he looked beyond the outward facade of the masses and into the hearts of those that came to hear him in Matthew chapter 11. As he looked within their restless souls and hearts and lives, the blessed Savior extended this gracious invitation to them in Matthew 11 and the verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is upon those words that I want to speak upon tonight in a message that I've entitled Gospel Rest. Gospel Rest. If tonight finds you in this house a restless soul, 
It is my prayer, and I know it was the prayer of those who gathered for the time of prayer, that you will receive this rest from Christ in the gospel. Concerning then the subject matter of gospel rest, I want you to notice, first of all, the seeker of it. The seeker of gospel rest. Who is it that seeks rest in the gospel? I believe the words of our text, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, identify the people that are the ones that are seeking the rest that is found in the gospel. Notice the first grouping of individuals, those that labor. All ye that labor. If you cross this province tonight and possibly in this house tonight, there are individuals and they're laboring in the works of their own self-righteousness in an attempt to attain to this gospel rest. Self-righteousness is simply an attempt to meet God's standard based upon one's own merits. Was that not the case in the life of Saul, later to be known as the Apostle Paul? Here was a man who prided himself in his own self-righteousness. We find him boasting of it over there in Philippians chapter 3, the verses 5 and 6. He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel at the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee concerning seal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Here's a man who was self-righteous, and yet I want you to notice that there was something restless about this man. We see that restlessness exhibiting itself as he went out and persecuted and hounded and pursued and he put to death those early New Testament Christians. Because having appeared outwardly to all that his religion had asked him to do, he was a man that was void of rest. That was until the day that grace captured him on the Damascus road. And then he found rest. True rest. Gospel rest in Jesus Christ. You may be an individual here tonight and you pride yourself in your own self-righteousness. You're a churchgoer, kind neighbor, dutiful citizen, a loving father, a devoted wife, a caring child, a loyal Protestant, a devoted Roman Catholic, one who adheres uh, to the dictates of the church, someone who conforms your life to the standards that is set down by the religious hierarchy and yet rest, true rest, gospel rest has evaded you until this moment of time. And tonight you're still seeking this rest. Listen, sinner, you may navigate around the rocks of the gross sins that others may commit. You may never murder someone. You may never abuse a child. You may never commit adultery. But you may still end up suffering shipwreck on the quicksands of self-righteousness. You see, there's nothing that sinful man loves more and a holy God of heaven hates more than that of self-righteousness. Let me reverently say that your righteousness, your self-righteousness, disdainfully spits into the face of Christ's righteousness. And so the, the question that you must answer tonight is this. Whose righteousness are you going to trust in for salvation? Your own righteousness or Christ's righteousness? Alexander McLaren said that which of all things unfits man for the reception of Christ as Savior is not gross licentiousness and outward venom and transgression, but it is self-complacency, fatal self-righteousness and self-sufficiency. If you want rest, gospel rest, then you need to look away from your own righteousness and you need to seek after Christ's righteousness. There's a wonderful verse that we find over in the book of Isaiah 32, the verse 17. I want to read it to you. It reminds us of what is the effect of righteousness given over to us. 
we see by faith alone, Isaiah 32, verse 17, the Word of God says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. That little word, quietness, within the text, it can also be translated rest. We could read literally the verse, The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, rest. Rest and assurance forever. Think of that sinner. The righteousness of Christ made over to you, imputed to you, gifted to you, placed on your account. What is the outworking of that within a life? It's rest. It's quietness. It's peace for the soul. Gospel rest is found in Christ's righteousness. Because it is that righteousness that will bring you into a right standing before the God of heaven. I tell you, sinner, it's on the grounds of Christ's righteousness, a righteousness that will be made over to you, or reckoned over to you on your repentance from sin and trusting in Jesus Christ. It is that righteousness that will pronounce you legally innocent in the high court of heaven. Righteousness of Christ. And it is that which you need and not your own righteousness. Because Isaiah the prophet reminds us that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy lies. But there are those and they labor in their self-righteousness. There are others and they labor in keeping the moral law in order to attempt to achieve such rest. It was the case in the life of that rich young ruler that we find over there in Matthew chapter 19, the Savior confronts him with six of those ten commandments. And the young man, he loudly pronounces, All these things have I kept from my youth up. And yet he goes on to ask the Savior, What lack I yet? Having attempted to keep the moral law of God, Here's a man who still knew that there was something, someone missing in his life. And he reckons that even if he had lived a life of morality, he realized that without Christ he would be lost. Without Christ you'll be lost. Maybe it's a reflection of your life tonight, this young man. Maybe there's an attempt in your part to conform to the law of God. And yet all your labors have been in vain. You've kept one commandment only to, keep, only to break another commandment. I tell you, a lifetime of labor and trying to keep the moral law of God will never, ever secure gospel rest for you. Never. I read over there in Romans 3 and the verse 20 that by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So it is only by an abandoning of your sin, casting yourself upon the mercy of God, that you'll ever find gospel rest. Yet there are others who labor in trying to find rest in the pleasures and the possessions and in the products of this world. Maybe that's you tonight. You're found in this house. This isn't your natural environment to be found somewhere like this tonight. And yet something has drawn you into this place. Because having attempted all these things, trying to find rest and peace in all these things, yet it seems to be that such rest has invaded you, and so it will. Rest is not found in possessions. There was a multimillionaire by the name of Jay Gould, an American millionaire, his net worth when he died was 51 million pounds. This is what Mr. Gould said when he was dying. He said this, I suppose I am the most miserable devil on earth. He found out that rest and peace could not be found in the world's possessions. I it will not be found in the world's pleasures either. I think of Lord Byron who reveled in pleasure all his days. He wrote on his last birthday these words, My days are like the yellow leaf, the flowers, the fruit of life are gone. 
the worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. And you'll not find it in the world's products. Listen to what Daniel Radcliffe of Harry Potter fame said on the radio one interview in 2012. He said, I drank in search of happiness and in search of a lifestyle that I thought would bring me to happiness. It didn't. I woke up one morning and said, I drank a lot, but I'm still not happy. And then he went on to say, on that interview, you can look at it on YouTube, it doesn't matter if you're financially very, very well off, it doesn't solve all of life's problems. If you center tonight those possessions you hope to find rest in, they'll soon corrupt and decay. You see those pleasures that you're now enjoying, they'll soon no longer satisfy you. You see those products that you presently bask in, they'll soon fade. Take it from those who have tried unsuccessfully to find their rest there for their soul and keep Christ's command and come to Him. Come to Christ. The seekers of the rest. But there is a second group of seekers those that are heavy laden. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. It carries the thought of being burdened down. And surely tonight the world is full of people who are heavy laden, those that are burdened down. I'm thinking about those that are heavy laden, burdened down, first of all, with the burden of sin and guilt. After murdering his own brother Abel, Cain cried out to God in Genesis 4 in the verse 13, my punishment, literally my sin. The Hebrew word is, my sin is greater than I can bear. Sin's burden was great, greater than this man could bear. And I tell you, sinner, tonight, I speak to you in Christ's precious name. Tonight there's a catalog of past sins to your account. And that account is growing greater and greater every day, dragging you deeper and deeper into despair. Tonight I would counsel you, sinner, to get to Christ, to get to Calvary, to get to the blood, to get to the Redeemer, to get to the cross, because burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. And maybe tonight sin is burdening you down and the guilt of the sin. Thank God there's a fountain filled with blood. Thank God the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all. I put emphasis on the word all. All sin. Wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever you've soiled your life with, Bless God, the blood can cleanse you tonight. And the burden can be lifted. There's relief found at the cross. Ah, because of sin and guilt, there's something else that burdens the sinner down. It is the burden of fear. Fear. Individuals in this land, you're maybe one. People who fear the future. Individuals who fear death, fear the grave, fear the hereafter, fear the judgment, fear hell. And sinner, you should fear all of those things. You should fear the future without Jesus Christ. You should, you should fear death. You should fear the grave. You should fear the hereafter. You should fear the judgment. You should fear hell. But can I say there's something else that you need to fear? You need to fear God. God. God is angry with the wicked every day. And it's only His mercy that He has not cut you off in your sin. The dying thief said to his compatriot in crime as he hung beside 
the blessed bleeding Christ of God. He said to him as he blasphemed him, Dost not thou fear God? Sinner, you ought to fear God. My Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And here you are tonight playing Russian roulette with your soul with little thought about trusting in Christ, little thought about coming to the Savior and turning from sin and living that Christian life. You have little thought of that. And yet I tell you, man, woman, you must fear God. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And oh, that you were wise if you understood this, that you would consider your latter end. Think of it, sinner. Think of your latter end tonight and make your decision for Christ on where you want to be in eternity. There are others tonight and you're heavy laden with the burden of regret and remorse. There's regret on the sinner's part. Yes, you. You who have sat under the ministry of greater preachers than I will ever be in my life's time. You who have sat for decades in this house and you're burdened down with regret. Regret that you haven't come to Christ sooner. Regret that sin has taken a toll on, on your body and on your health. Regret that that son or daughter of yours have followed you into the world. And you led them there. You led them there. You bought them their first drink. You gave them their first cigarette. You drove them to their first nightclub. Regret. Regret on the part of the sinner, yes. Regret on the part of the backslider. Regret. That you ever walked away from the Lord in the first place. Regret that you've wasted so many, so, so many, so many precious years. Regret. Regret that you're found in such a cold state tonight. Regret that sin has taken you further than you ever intended to go. Regret. Tonight you're heavy laden with the burden of regret. Take that burden. Cast it at the cross of Calvary. Take your burden to him and he'll exchange it for gospel rest. We've considered the seekers of the rest. Our final points are not as long, so don't be worrying. We've thought about the seekers. Note in relation to gospel rest, the second point, the source of it. Where is this rest? This rest that, that you have been so, so looking for? This rest that has, to this moment of time, invaded you in your life? Where is this rest to be found? Well, can I say that it's not found at the end of a line of cocaine? This rest is not found in a joint of cannabis. This rest is not found at the bottom of a whiskey or of a vodka bottle. This rest is not found at the town or the tar bar. It's not found at the manor hotel. It's not found at Glen's bar. It's not found at Carmichael's. It's not found in the British Legion. It's found in Christ. Christ. The words of our text identify the source of the rest. Come on to me, the Master said, and I will give you rest. I'm told by linguists this personal pronoun I within the text 
it's found emphasized in the original Greek. Let me read it to you as it ought to be read. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I, even I, will give you rest. The Savior did not say, come on to me, and I will show you rest, and yet hold it from you in a sadistic way. He didn't say, come on to me, and I'll teach you about rest, but never allow you to practically experience it. He did not say, come on to me, and I'll tell you about, I'll tell you about this rest, but never actually give it on to you. But rather, he said, come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. It is a gift. This rest is a gift. The Lord Jesus Christ, he did not say, come on to me if you live in an affluent part of Balamoni, but if you live in a housing state where there's drugs that are rampant and there's alcohol abuse and there's family abuse and where the police are out every weekend knocking doors and trying to settle the peace, you can't come on to me. No, the Lord Jesus Christ made nothing like that. Sinner, he made no emphasis like that. He did not set down parameters. He just said, if you labor and you're heavy laden, then come, come, come unto me. Wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Why can rest only be found in Christ? Well, the answer is very simple, because he only can. He only can deal with the root cause of a sinner's restlessness. And no matter what you think, sinner, the restlessness that you're presently experiencing in your soul has not been caused by your disadvantaged upbringing. It hasn't been caused because of your dysfunctional home. And it's not the result of a dismal educational record on your account. The restlessness that you're experiencing tonight is due to your depraved, sinful nature. Sin. And only Christ can deal with sin. Only his blood can deal with with sin. Because you see, my friend, sin is the greatest disturbance of men's soul. Sin is the greatest agitator of a woman's conscience. Sin is the greatest troubler of men and women's hearts. It is sin, sin, that makes you restless tonight. But thank God Jesus Christ died for sin. He died for sin. There's only one way to deal with your restlessness and that is by coming to Christ. Only the blood sacrifice of the innocent Christ has been sufficient by God to put away sin. Only the finished work of Christ is adequate to satisfy the law's demands and appease the wrath of a holy God. Thomas Brooks, when he was writing about this rest, he said, Christ alone has the greatest power to give it the greatest will to give it, and the greatest right to give it. This rest is not found in the Free Presbyterian Church. This rest is not found in the Church's sacraments, baptism, or the Lord's table. This rest is not found by your religiosity and by your good works, but this rest, its source in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I put it to you tonight, Will you come to him? Will you come to the Savior? Will you leave your sin and come on to him who has promised to give you rest? Now are you tonight in this house seeking for rest? Rest from an accusing conscience. Rest for a guilty heart. Rest for a troubled mind. Rest for a downcast spirit. Then come on to Christ. It's not me who calls you to the Savior. Thank God it's Christ himself. In sweetest, tenderest tones, he says to you tonight, Come on to me, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. The Father's well-beloved Son, it is him who called you. 
the delight of the glorified saints. It is him who calls you the joy of the church of the firstborn. It is he that calls you. It is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Come. Come. You refuse such an invitation? Maybe you are in this house tonight and you think, if I came in, there would be no room for me. Ira Stampo was preaching in a meeting in Kansas, Kansas City in 1946. As it was his practice, before that meeting commenced every night, he asked the people within the congregation to submit suggested song titles that he would then write a hymn on. That evening he returned home and he started to clear out his pockets upon which there were written on little scraps of paper suggested song titles. There was one that took his attention that particular evening, struck a chord with his heart. He began to write a hymn. It would later be used in many evangelistic campaigns and recorded by numerous Christian singers. The words of that hymn's chorus are these. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. It was that very hymn, the words of which were used in the salvation of a despairing young man who was bent on taking his own life. That young man with a gun in his pocket found himself walking past a tent in Germany where gospel meetings were conducted by the evangelist Willard Cantillon. Al Gar was directing the music for the service that night, and as the young man passed the door of that tent, he heard Al Gar sing, There's room at the cross for you. That young man was so arrested and gripped by the message within that hymn that he found himself within that tent for the very first time he heard the gospel. He listened to the gospel, and at the conclusion of that meeting, he trusted in Jesus Christ as a, as a Savior. That same young man would later study for the ministry, and he would go across the country and become an evangelist, and he would tell others, there's room at the cross for you. Tonight, sinner, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. Samuel Rutherford said, There are many heads resting on Christ's bosom, but there is room for yours there. Very quickly and finally, we're thinking about the sureness of this gospel rest. We thought about the seekers of it, the source of it, the sureness of what? The sureness of it. Mark the words of the blessed Savior when he said, And I will, I will give you rest. You know, there are many things in, that people promise to do for you. It's sad to say, men often let you down, but never the Savior. You have his word. Sinner, it's in black and white before you if you can see a Bible before you. The Lord Jesus Christ said that he will. He will give you rest. He'll not fail in fulfilling his word. And so the question is, will you venture on the promise? Because the promise is that if you come to him, having labored, tonight burdened down with your sin and with your regret and with your remorse and with your fears, thank God he's promised that he will give you rest. What happens to those who do not come? Well, if you turn to the book of the Revelation when you go home, you turn to the chapter 14 and the verse number 11, you'll read of the unalterable faith that awaits the one who does not come to Christ. I read in, their, in these words, And the smoke of their torment, 
has sent us up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night. No rest. And so the choice is quite simple. Will you rest in Christ tonight and enjoy gospel rest? Or will you go out of this meeting, this first meeting of this mission, rejecting that rest and go out into a lost eternity where there will never be any rest? How do I seek that rest? Very simply, go to Christ. And go just as you are, with all your sin, with all your fears, with all your regret, with all your guilt, and go without delay. Go now where you sit. Seek him. Take him as your Savior. Come. Come without delay. And so the question is, will you come? If you come to him, he will give you rest. I trust that you'll come. That's why in prayer. I'm going to close just in a word of prayer. Are you seeking rest? Well, here is where it's found. In Christ and his cross. Tonight the Lord has spoken to you and you're troubled about your soul. I'll be at the door. Reverend Park will be at the door. We'll be greeting you there. Speak to us. Intimate to us. We'll be glad to bring you to some quiet place in this place. We'll take the word of God and show you how you can become a recipient of this rest. I trust that you'll not put off these things, but you'll come to Christ. Our Father and our God, leave the, le- the rest of this meeting with thee. We give everything into thy care. We cry to thee that thou wilt speak to hearts. We pray that you'll convert the lost, that you'll restore the backslider. Lord, that you'll encourage thy people. O grant, Heavenly Father, the blessing of heaven upon this meeting. Send the Holy Ghost for Christ's sake. Convict of sin and draw men and women to the blessed Savior. And take us to our home safely. And bless these good things provided. We offer prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.